He is a connoisseur of the details. He is somebody who used his unique communication style uh, to make a whole lot of money, which is very creative. Um, he was able to use masking to build a personal brand. And really, he was able to use his sensitive stomach and some of his stomach concerns to center same food at the center of his brand. And he made a living and great money doing his special interest. Welcome to the Autistic Culture Podcast. Each episode, we dive deep into autistic contributions to society and culture by introducing you to some of the world's most famous and successful autistics in history. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer on how we use the word autistic. The purpose of this show is not to diagnose the people or characters we discuss as autistic. While some may have announced being autistic, what we're sharing here is our observation of what is representative of autistic culture. It can sometimes be difficult for autistic people to celebrate our natural tendencies and traits due to the perception of autism as a disorder that needs to be fixed, a long history of damaging medical interventions to try and get us to fit in with mainstream culture, and protective masking skills many of us have developed to try to stay safe. Whether you are autistic or just love someone who is, your host is Dr. Angela Loria, the linguistic autistic. And licensed psychological practitioner, Matt Lowry, welcome you to take this time to be fully immersed in the language, values, traditions, norms, and identity of Autistica. Autistica. Episode 33. Warhol is autistic. Well, hey, Matt. Hey, Angela. How's it going? It's going good. Are you ready to talk about Andy Warhol? Andy Warhol? I am always ready to talk about Andy Warhol. <laughs> oh, I'm like not, but I did a bunch of research for this episode and it made me interested, uh, much more interested. I have I don't know, whatever. I like the art. It seems fine. It's very America. I'm like, he's a thing. I get it. But uh, as I researched it more, I was like, wow, this is an amazing story of autistic culture. So I'm yeah. super excited to share it with you there's there's some strange twists and turns as you would expect from andy warhol i like and, it and it all started on one sweltering august day in 1928 in the Ooh. neighborhood of oakland pittsburgh pennsylvania where andrew warhola was born to very dirt poor slovakian immigrants his father was a construction worker um, and his mother was an embroiderer. They came over as immigrants. Their English was not solid. And Andy was um, an awkward kid. He was sort of sickly. He was mostly friends with the girls. He didn't really fit in. Super, super close with his mom. So his dad was a yeller. His dad was like kind of rough. And he bonded with his mom. His mom tried to protect him from his dad. And um, when he was eight, he got something, I think it's pronounced Correa, C-H-O-R-E-A. Never heard of this, but it's Maybe. also apparently called St. Vitus Dance, which is a weird name for a disease. So it's a rare and fatal disease of the nervous system. Oh, wow. I yeah. don't know. Do we like <laughs> cure St. Vitus dance at some point? I don't know. But yeah. he's in bed for months and months, can't go to school. And it was during these months while he's sick in, in bed, his mom, like she's an embroiderer, right? So she's also like an artist in general. And she starts giving him drawing lessons. And he became obsessed with with drawing. So this is where it all begins in Pittsburgh, PA, immigrant family learns drawing from his mom. Very nice. Okay. So he was uh, at nine, his mom comes up with this idea that he should also learn photography. 
And a, a lot of his famous work that we know, like the Marilyn Monroe portrait, some of his dog stuff, what he actually did is he would take a picture, he'd blow it up, and he'd draw on top of it. I, I learned how to draw doing uh, something very similar, only, you know, printers. So, yeah. Yeah, right? So yeah. kind of interesting. So he takes up photography. So he's nine. This is like 1937. That's impressive. know enough about photography, but this is... These are like the old cameras. Like this is like the pinhole. This is not a uh, an iPhone that he was working with here. Where you have to develop the film yourself. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So um, his mom helps him set up a makeshift dark room in their basement. He is photographing, developing, drawing on the photos. Like his art is developing. And at this point, I started to get interested in his story because I... I have a um I have a pretty great relationship with work and money. I've always felt really lucky about this. Yeah. And it's because my father is undiagnosed autistic and when we were brought up, we were it's not like my dad lectured us on this. We were just taught that when you're a kid, you will find the thing that you're madly in love with and then you will make lots of money doing the thing you love. And I literally thought this is how it worked for everyone. So the iconic story is my dad gets a hold of Hot Rod magazine when he's a little kid and he decides he wants to spend his life making hot rods. And so he gets a shoe shine box and he goes to the steps of St. Mary's Church in New Haven, Connecticut. And for a quarter, sir, maybe it was a nickel, starts shining shoes on the steps of the church saves all his money, and eventually, when he's, I think, 15 or 16, buys his first car, fixes it up, sells it, and today, my dad is in the Hot Rod Hall of Fame. So, Wow, that's an interesting uh, trip there. That That's, that's kind of neat. I just thought that's what everyone did. Yeah. And so I I know not everybody's watching the video, but I will tell you my, my shoe shine moment Right here. So when I was seven years old, I wrote a book of poetry called Lifelong Chances. I do not know why it's seven. I thought Lifelong Chances was a good name for a book. Ambitious. Um, right. So I started writing poetry at seven and I was like, well, obviously I'll make lots of money as a writer. I mean, what, how else would it work? And nothing else ever popped into my mind. Nothing ever occurred to me that I would do anything than make lots of money from writing. Monotropic focus there. Right. I thought everybody had that. So the funny story is my college roommate uh, actually grew up in Connecticut where I grew up and her in Connecticut insurance is a big industry. And her dad had worked at Aetna or something his whole career. And he was retiring at 56 and they had a retirement party. And I walked up to him I'm like, Mr. Inglis, like, congratulations on your retirement. I have one question for you. Stephanie has never told me, when did you fall in love with insurance? And he just sort of like, he laughs, he pats me on the shoulder. Stephanie and I are driving home and I'm like, your dad wouldn't tell me his story. Like, how did he fall in love with insurance? Like, how old was he? When did he know? What is it about insurance? She's like, my dad hated his job every day. And I was like, wait, people hate their jobs? So I was 21 years old when I figured out that not everybody loves their job. This this is the thing I don't get about the neurotypical world. I don't understand why or how it is normalized to do something that you hate for 70 years right. just, just to eat. Crazy. 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. You're yes. going to do something you don't like? What? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It's a very strange culture I do not understand. And I love that I was just in this bubble. I was yes. totally in a bubble and had no idea that people did not love their jobs. So I love that Andy Warhol and I share this experience of like, well, obvi, I'm going to be successful as an artist. I mean, what else am I going to do? This is so, the way. 
it is the way. So, and he was obviously very successful as an artist, always knew he would be. He went to what's now Carnegie Mellon. At the time, it was the Carnegie Institute for Technology. Yeah. And he went to school for the ever popular major of pictorial design. That's so, that's an interesting term. Right. I don't know. That's some, um, it was, it was, he was there 45 to 49. Um, and when he graduated, he like packed a bag and went to New York city and got a job. His first job was at glamor magazine. And he was one of the most successful commercial artists of the 1950s. And when you are working in your special interest, that does not surprise you that you are successful. Cause how could you not be? What would the alternative be? Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing the thing that I love and I do it well. So of course I am fabulously successful. And he, I mean, he obviously studied, but in college, he struggled with the academics of it all and um, especially writing. So he, he hated writing. Dyspraxia. And, and, and yes, exactly. And also we think potentially dyslexia. Ooh. And I will share with you why I think that. Um, because when he, we found some letters, uh, that he wrote and we found a lot of stuff. We'll talk about all the stuff we found, but we found some letters he wrote. And, uh, so he spelled video, like his whole career was in video. He spelled video V E D I O. He spelled Ooh, interesting. Polaroid P O L O R R O D for Polaroid. Uh, he spelled script again, a word he probably would have used quite a lot S C R P I T. And he was transposing really into, the letters, yeah. And he was re weirdly into plastic and he spelled plastic P A S T I C, which That's think about a New York accent, right? Yeah, I'm gonna get yeah. some plastic. So, yeah. um Writing it as he uh, sees it in his head, as he uh, spells it, as, as he enunciates it. Yeah, that's that's a thing. That's right. very, very common for autistic people. Yeah, and, and really avoided writing and majored in pictorial design. He was like, well, this is what I'm going to, I'm good at. He was so good in school that between having girlfriends who wrote his papers for him and professors who were blown away by his work, he made it through. He graduated. And I know for me, there are areas where I struggled that partly because I was so good at other things, I was able to pick the right classes or convince the right teachers or find a way through it. Um, survive by any means necessary. Yeah. And look, he survived 10 years of working in New York doing commercial design. That's, so that's I should say- impressive. Andy Warhol is not diagnosed as autistic, and there are many people in his estate who are very annoyed with people who suggest he might be autistic. What I'm going to share with you are aspects of autistic culture that I see through his story. But uh, in their favor, he kept a job in commercial art for 10 years, which is not a feat I was able to accomplish. I got fired like within a year of any job I got. Um, I, there's some in autistic culture, like natural aversion to hierarchies, uh, general bullshit and definitely small talk like, and Andy Warhol was not going to, but again, I think like he was so good Yeah, and they made so much money off of him. Yeah. Which obviously a lot of his work comments on that. And the work of pop art is to comment on um, commercialism. So somehow he made him enough money to keep his job and they put him in some sort of eccentric bucket. Um, but yeah. maybe that's and, evidence and, of something. And that's the thing, because uh, the, the, the label of artist allows a bit of eccentricity to, to go along with it. So the neurotypicals can say, ah, oh, yes, he's weird, but useful because yeah. that's how them artist people is. Yeah. I guess that's what we have to put up with if we're going to get good art that makes us lots of money. So yeah. anyway, he um, gets into painting at the end of the late fifties, makes some fancy friends and decides to quit his job and uh, changes the landscape of visual art 
forever with a work that you probably know, the Campbell's Soup product. So it's 32 identical cans of Campbell's tomato soup. And on the back of each painting, there is another painting. Do you know? And think a autistic painting under a me. painting. Yeah. So on the back, so you, so it's the tomato soup can. There's 32 of them. You flip over the whole painting and there's 32 other paintings. As an autistic person, what would you put with tomato soup on the back? I, I would put grilled cheese. That is correct. Oh my God. Really? That is correct. Oh, that's fantastic. It is the right answer. It is the autistic <laughs> answer. It is Andy Warhol's answer. That is beautiful. I love the symmetry to that. It's he had, so good. Yeah. He he says, I want some soup, but I got to have grilled cheese. So I yeah, mean, might as well pair them together. Yeah. So good. That is I would fantastic. Say, I see you, Andy. I see you. So people ascribe all these things because he comes from the advertising industry and who he's friends with. He's friends with all these people that are into comic books like Chuck Close and... Um, uh, uh, Roy Lichtenstein and so they're all like super into this comic book thing and they're they're saying and I'm not saying this is wrong but they're talking about his commentary on commercialism sure I guess I don't know what I can tell a man you can't is, just like soup dude dude like soup ate Campbell's tomato soup and a grilled cheese Every day, <laughs> every single day. And here is what I think. That shit is a calendar. That's a visual calendar. So very often autistic people like to look at visual cues. That is his visual calendar of what he is eating. That is like why there is a tomato soup can and grilled cheese on the back. I, I like that so much. That's fantastic. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We love sharing stories of autistic culture. And if you are seeing yourself in any of these stories and you're wondering if maybe you're one of us or maybe you're already diagnosed or self-diagnosed and you want to know if Matt can help you live your life better and be more authentically autistic, check out his website at Matt Lowry L pp.com. That's Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y. And then that LPP, it stands for Licensed Psychological Practitioner. So head on over to mattlowrylpp.com and learn more about working with my buddy, Matt. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe he had some big political statement. Again, part of his whole shtick was he would never tell you what his statement was. But if you wanted him to talk, <laughs> one of the very few things he would happily talk about. So people would be like, what does this mean? Is it about consumerism? Is it about mass production? And he'd be like, it's about soup. <laughs> I like soup. <laughs> I because soup. again, neurotypical people love ulterior motives. Neurotypical yes! people love diving in and exploring the meaning of it. But the man just wanted some soup. Man, I, I like. I don't know. I don't want to be an art critic here. But every single interview, when people are like, "What's the deeper meaning?" His answer is, "I like soup." And I think the deeper meaning might be he likes soup. He and what he would do, he loved the labels, and he would line up the cans. And I don't want you to see my. Like my bathroom, my, I love for labels out. You cannot have conditioner and shampoo that's not missing. They must be like, that's not matching. They must be lined up. My soup cans are a hundred percent lined up labels out. Yes, 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 yes. Why would you I, have I, labels if you weren't going to line them up and face them labels out? Because that's madness. That's chaos. <laughs> Only an insane person would have the labels facing to the back. All of my, uh, again, my soup, Campbell's soup, uh, the shameless plug. I, oh, so, so this is the thing. This is the thing. My, my mother growing up did not understand me being autistic. I ate Campbell's vegetable beef soup literally every school day from the time I was in kindergarten until I got into high school. 
a a can of Campbell's soup, some saltine crackers. That was my lunch okay, every mine was single day. Campbell's sirloin steak soup. Did you ever have the sirloin steak soup? I, I, I have burger? not because because again, I had the one soup. That was my soup. I had but, the one soup. Why venture out when you know what works? But this is the thing. Campbell's tomato soup, that's what worked. Why change it up? Who Why? needs that? Why? It would be like changing a shirt and your shirt might be scratchy when you know this one is good. If I came on here wearing a bright red shirt, people would think that I had a stroke. We would this be is, alarmed. Yes. You would be alarmed. I would. <laughs> number one, why is there a bright red shirt in my closet? But number two, why am I wearing this? I, I wear black shirts. This is what I wear. And that's... I. This is the way. This is the way. I right. mean, granted, there are a lot of people who stim by eating, so they're very adventurous eaters. But sure. again, if you have that, if you have the security, go for the security because you go know it for works. the security. And especially like, look, you're changing careers. You're trying to sell art. Like there are enough variables you for sure can't control. If there's a variable you can control, why not control it? People coming up to you all day asking about your soup paintings and whether or not they're about soup. Because, like, is this soup painting about soup? It's about soup. Why Why are you asking me such <laughs> odd questions? <laughs> right. What? Jeez. <laughs> right. And so, yeah. So the other thing that happened with his, his dad dies when he's pretty young. But his mom has, like, I don't know if it's colon cancer, but oh. they have to remove her colon and she has a colostomy bag. Oh, and so I, I think you get fed through a feeding tube or she's on an all liquid diet and I, there's no joy in food for her. And he's like, he's got some health issues. He's never really gotten over this neurological thing. He's got like some skin issues. Like he's got a bunch of issues. So like you don't want to introduce things to your GI system that are not going to go well when you're meeting like famous art critics and shit. Yes. And so when he would go to dinner parties, he would eat before. Of course. Yeah. Taking care of all the extra variables. Right. So when he'd get to the dinner party, he wouldn't eat, but he would be able to talk. He'd be able to like make connections and not have to worry about like ending up in the bathroom or having some sort of reaction this is a popular way of doing things yeah it's a good it's a good he like figured out his accommodations and the thing is that he loved dessert sugary foods he loved candy and um so you know he built into his life ways of eating that worked for him and this is a story from uh, an auto uh, a biography of him he recounts that his mother gave him candy bars as a reward for every page completed in a coloring book. As an adult, he continued to dote on sweet treats. Tom Wolfe reports Andy refusing food at the society dinner parties and declaring, Oh, I only eat candy. After he was shot in 1968 and could for a time only tolerate liquids, he would retreat to the restaurant Serendipity 3 on East 60th Street and nurse a frozen hot chocolate. A frozen hot chocolate. He was shot. Sounds good, right? He was shot. Yeah. Crazy. Who and shot that, Andy Warhol? It, that sounds like the name of a movie. That sounds like a very good movie. So uh, he was shot. I had missed this whole story of Andy Warhol being shot. So it was actually one of his, one of the actresses. And there's this whole thing about, is Andy Warhol sexist? I, I don't know. We're not going to talk about this today. But basically... Uh, her name is Valerie Solanas. She was a writer. She had been in his films and she, it was actually like, um, 1968 mass shooting. So oh, it was God. at the factory. So this was like the place where he set up where all his artists got together. Art critic Mario Maya was there. Fred Hughes was there and she, uh, opened up the elevator doors and pfft, just like wow. shot a bunch of people. Andy Warhol almost died. He had a single bullet in his lungs, his esophagus, esophagus, spleen, liver, and stomach. Wow. He was in the hospital for two months, had like multiple surgeries for years for the rest of his life. Wow. And like for a long time could only 
like drink which or have liquid so hopefully the tomato soup was in there i don't know if it was too acidic but he yeah. did make his way back to um to campbell soup so i didn't know any of that but again so much uh, uncertainty, you're going to see why it's so important for him to control his environment. You got to control the chaos because, wow. People might come and shoot you that you can't control. So, yeah. Wow. So that happened. Um, and he is known, like, it gets interpreted again, all of his stuff and, and the Andy Warhol museum leans into this all gets in, interpreted as like this, this plot, like he's eating candy bars and he's drinking frozen hot chocolate. And, uh, he's like having these sugary snacks and he's eating unhealthy. And it's some sort of, he's got some, secret agenda that only Andy Warhol knows to make a commentary on consumerism. And it's very funny because I can't find anything. I read his autobiography, which is called From A to B. Um, he really hates the letter B and he really loves the letter A. And there's a lot of time spent on that. Like he can wax poetic about the letter A, I can tell you all about it, loves it. Letter B, his nemesis. There is nothing really about his treatise on consumerism. Like he is not pulling out the little red book and quoting. Uh, he must've been really conflicted about uh, the Swedish supergroup ABBA. It, oh yeah, woo, woo, that's like a whole, I wish I could, if I interviewed Andy Warhol, let me tell you, if we could get him as a guest on this show, that is a question he would enjoy answering. The questions <laughs> that other people asked him, let me tell you, he did not enjoy them, and he answered in unique ways. We will discuss. <laughs> shortly. Well, well, that, like that's the thing. That's uh, every morning I enjoy drinking strong coffee, and then I retreat to a little closet with water in it for about ten minutes. What am I doing there? Who knows? And like you got to come up with strange answers because you know taking a poo. Just is not a good enough answer. You know, I have to go to a mystical realm to defeat the demons. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to mess with it because what is this soup painting about? Uh, I don't know. Hair? Why? The meaning of life. Because yeah. I said so. Figure it out. And the neurotypicals exactly. love the mystery. God, it's so they insane. They love the mystery. And then he would sort of... I mean, I love that he capitalized that, but he'd sort of punk them. Well, so, yeah, yeah, you got to, because what is this obvious thing about? Something not obvious. Oh, my. That's such a good answer. I would have never guessed, of course. You're Why amazing. Not? Can yeah. I spend $50,000 on your art? So he actually, as the kid of an immigrant, was super into America. Oh, and, yeah. um And so a lot of the things, like, he loved uh have to do with like american culture and he embraced american culture which is all about consumerism so people were like what does this mean I i'm not sure there are all these deeper meanings they're looking for but you told me a story about a whopper a whopper yeah yeah it, it yeah i there was this uh, wonderful idea that uh, Warhol admired the idea in that in America, the same food and drinks are consumed by people regardless of their status. The president drinks the same Coke as him. The clash of cultures deeply influenced his subject matter of his art, and a burger might uh, well appear as a tribute to the idea of American life. So there's this one uh, uh, photo shoot where he was asked to eat a hamburger. And he showed up, and he was presented with a Whopper, and he was like, oh, I was hoping it would be McDonald's. And they're like, oh, yeah, we can go out and get McDonald's. He's like, no, uh, it's fine. I'll eat this. But his reasoning was he just likes the packaging, the design of McDonald's packaging better. So there's a video, and we'll link to it in the show notes, of him just simply eating a Whopper. Yeah. And you know what it was about? Uh, I'm guessing uh, capitalism uh, and uh, the JFK uh, assassination. Or him just eating a Whopper, one Ooh! or the other, you decide. What a novel concept. <laughs> what a novel concept. A man eats a hamburger is a man eating a hamburger. 
Oh, God. I don't know. I don't know. That's just what I see looking at this all through uh, an uh, autistic culture lens. Uh, GI system, uh, GI symptoms in autistic culture, very common, higher rates of abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, obviously he has this whole thing with his mom. So he's worried about like losing a colon. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, he weirdly does not die from that gunshot. But in a strange way, ends up dying of gallbladder issues, complications from his gallbladder. That so is fascinating. He, yeah. He, they had to remove his gallbladder. And then there were, he ended up actually dying of a heart attack, but he was in the hospital and had the heart attack because of his gallbladder surgery. So oh. all of that, I have gallbladder issues. I've had like a hiatal hernia. They're always talking about removing my gallbladder. I have all the stomach things. And this is the way. So I totally get, I, like, I don't mix up my foods a lot. And like, there are all these like diets that people want to prescribe to me, but like, I know what works for my body. And I, I, so anyway, I was kind of feeling him on the food stuff. And I think that has an effect on um, just culturally how we show up and interact in the world. And here's just like a fun tip. If you're listening, if you're autistic, asking for accommodations about food, like what are the five things that you'll eat? Just whoever you're going to visit, just tell them to like get it for you. They will. They'll be happy to. Instead yeah. of having to have the weird conversations about how you won't eat their like venison burgers with, you know, whatever their like weird cow tongue shit they want you to eat. Like w just tell them, get, p just pick up a couple cans of Campbell's soup. I like tomato. And if you want to get Wonder Bread and Land O'Lakes American cheese, maybe some butter, that would be great. Also Land O'Lakes. Like, but for the just, love of God, don't substitute the brands because I can't do Instacart because they'll substitute the brands. No, no I brand, want, no. I need the thing that I ordered. If it's not, it might as well be serving me gravel. I'm not going to eat the thing that you don't, that, Yeah. I, I specifically requested this. No substitutions. For the love of God, just look around in the general area. Don't give me... I, uh, so frustrating. It, Instacart kills me for that reason. I am very picky about every single brand. Like, there is... I this only is want this one. So... Yeah. And I'm 100% sure. I mean, that's like, you know the McDonald's Whopper thing. Like, I don't even know the reasons for all of the reasons why I like the brands I like. Maybe it is the packaging in some cases. I'm sure it is. There are some bags that I find so awkward to open that I just don't enjoy opening. Like the, I don't love with the Oreos, the, yeah, the yeah. noise of the yeah. peel on the top. So if you hand me Oreos in a Ziploc, I'm good. But if I have to that's not for me yeah 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 and that that's the thing these people don't think of that design and it's just i don't know but yeah that's it's a barrier and i choose uh stuff that is easy to open because oh my god i got some welch's uh uh, uh fruit snacks mm -hmm. those little packages you you think you can rip them open but they're made out of tungsten you can't yeah that's I, a scissor I, yeah. affair that's exactly a scissor affair, my the friend. hell yeah. man yeah <sighs> God. So here, here's my advice. If somebody says when you're visiting, hey, can I get you anything? Just give them a list of your same foods. It's fine. Give them the brands and be like, no big deal. If you can't grab it, we can run to the store. Don't feel bad about asking for that. And then for people who love autistic people, if you're hosting them or if they're your child, they we don't need to experiment. I know you do. It might be fun for you unless the autistic person you love is like, I would love to experiment. Let's get weird stomach of sea bass. And I would like to eat that. Like whatever, I, like listen to the people you love. But if somebody tells you they want Campbell's tomato soup, the most loving thing you can do is get Campbell's tomato soup, Wonder Bread, Land O'Lake salted butter, Land O'Lake white American cheese. Just get that. Just get that. It's not yep. more loving to get us five kinds of cheese. Now we just feel bad. We didn't eat the other four. It's not more loving to introduce us to your love of Kerry Gold butter. We want Land Lake salted. Like just, just, just do it. Just do it. Yeah, we'll yeah, love you extra. Yeah. Don't argue with us. 
don't tell us we should try a different brand. We know what we like. Trust us. And if we die of gall bar- chronic gallbladder issues, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, metaphorically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay. The I think one of the big things is the trauma that comes from like always being told like don't eat that don't eat candy like one of the things he would fight with his dad was he wanted his dad to or his dad wanted him to like act neurotypical like don't act so gay don't act so weird don't act so eccentric and um the the biography which is by Wayne uh, Kostenbaum this is the biography of Andy Warhol I Um, read. And just getting back to his speech, we talked about how he probably has dyslexia, maybe dyspraxia. I think there's a little echolalia. And so check out this quote. (laughs) Uh, Trauma was the motor of his life and speech the first wound. Painful for him to speak or to write, to be interviewed. One way he could mobilize words was to employ lists and repetitions. Oh, boy. At the end of an interview in John Hallowell's book, The Truth Game, 1969, Andy launches one of his lists. Its repetitions lubricate impeded speech and forestall rapport with the interlocutor. That's a quote. Screening out Hallowell's nosy questions, because screw those, Andy says, Favorite tie, favorite pickle, favorite ring, favorite Dixie cup, favorite ice cream, favorite hippie, favorite record, favorite song, favorite movie, favorite Indian, favorite penny, favorite feet, favorite fish, favorite saint, favorite sin, favorite be- beetle. Fascinating. Right? Wow. That is really, really autistic speech. And, and that's the thing. Overcoming situational mutism through the use of lists and scripting. Yeah. That, right. is, that is the autistic way. Yeah. And so, but then because he's an artist and eccentric, people are like, what does it mean? Like, nobody's (laughs) like, it means he's autistic and he's like (laughs) using his communication skills. (laughs) So there's another, uh, there's another story that's kind of like this. So this guy is actually autistic, hashtag Ian Stewart. He's also dead, died in 1985, but was diagnosed before he died. Ian Stewart was the co-founder of the Rolling Stones. Oh. Now. Whole story about this dude, because he was kicked out of the Rolling Stones after they were famous, but before they were super famous, by the band manager, basically, in Ian's opinion, because he was autistic. So lack of, you know, neurosensitivity there at the time in 1965. And so he, his special interest, Ian Stewart's, was autism. And he was like, fucking Andy Warhol is autistic. And he would tell people all the time, which, by the way, is kind of like saying that guy's gay. Like, it's probably not a great best practice. But um, he would always point out when Andy Warhol would do an interview, he would point out like this weird shit he did. And he's like, do you notice how he answers in one words? Or do you notice how everything he says, he's just copying teenagers So it didn't matter, like, what the question was. He would often answer, like, really up there, man. It's really (laughs) up there, man. It's really up there, man. He'd, like, have these, like, phrases, these sort of sing-songy phrases in his head that were, like, teenagers. He was not a teenager. He's, like, in his 40s. But he starts speaking in these, like, sing-songy teen phrases. Wow. Scripting to deal with the... The bullshit small talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, so what is your inspiration? Groovy, dude. It's groovy, man. It's really up there. Like, Wow. So good. Okay, so this is one of my favorite ones. He has, I have a complete crush. I'm super sad she died of, I think, a heroin overdose. But he has this friend who's an actress. Her name is Edie Sedgwick. Have you ever seen Oh, her? yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. God. She's like my dream pixie girl. She's got this like cute, short blonde hair. She's like the most beautiful face. And he gets invited to be on the Merv Griffin show. Yeah. And he's like, 
Can I bring my friend? I'm going to put the, you guys have to watch this. They're going to put this in the show notes. You have to watch it. So good. So he's like, can I bring my friend? I don't know what's the deal with 60s talk shows, but Edie and Andy, which maybe everybody did this, but they show up with a coat. They both have their coats over their arm and they both have purses. So he has a man bag. She has a purse. And they walk in with their their coat. Like they just like walked in. Did everybody walk into an interview with their coat and a bag? They like put their coat on the back of the chair. They put the bag under their seat. I was like, this is so weird. We just got off the bus. Yeah. It was very (laughs) There's no green room or anything. So they sit down and Edie tells Merv for this interview, what's going to happen is Andy is going to whisper his answers in my ear. Oh my God. Situational mutism with an anchor person. Go on. So he's like, okay. And then after he whispers it in your ear, will you tell me? And she's like, no, he wants me to then whisper it in your ear. That is fascinating. Yeah. So they go through this whole interview and Andy only has one word answers. His answers are yes or no. And the only two things he'll do is either shake his head or he'll whisper in Edie's ear and then she will translate for him. Wow. And people are like, oh, my God, he's such an artist. What does this mean? We can never be truly understood. We must always have an interlocutor. Like... I think I know what it means. This is fascinating in that neurotypicals love hidden meaning, but completely miss the obvious. Mm. It fascinates me literally to no end. Because I I will literally say before I hire someone, I'm like, I'm autistic. You need to know if I ever have a problem with you, I want you to know what it's going to look like. Yeah. I will reach out to you and I will say... I have a problem. I would like to talk about it. Yes. I, there's no other way it's going to look ever. And then, I don't know, I'll go out of town and not talk to someone for two weeks. And I'll find out that they said to another employee, Angela hasn't talked to me for two weeks. I think she's going to fire me. I'm like, what? Wh- I literally told you, this is what it's going to look like. If I'm about to fire you, I'm not just going to show up and say you're fired in some weird narcissistic Donald Trump insanity. I'm literally going to say, I have a problem. Can we talk about it? Not hearing from me means I don't have a problem. It, it just means that you're busy with umpteen other things and haven't gotten around to them yet. Craziness. So It's fascinating. Mm. They, they love looking for hidden meaning, but they don't actually have the 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 focus to look at the details yeah oh my god it's so it it's they live in a world full of magic where things there is no antecedent consequence it's just random things happen well the thing i will say about art critics is art critics do have the ability to look at details right and they Find details out of nothing. They're like conspiracy theorists about Andy Warhol. They're like, there is a small dot in the bottom right-hand corner. And there are dots in the Communist Manifesto. I'm like... Well, this this is why John Lennon wrote, I am the walrus. Because he got so frustrated that people were looking too deeply into Beatles lyrics. That he said, here, let him chew on this. I am the Eggman. I am the walrus. Cuckoo, kachu. Cuckoo, kachu. Yeah. Motherfuckers. Yeah. yeah. Eat it. Right. So, um, uh, but I do think this is cool. So in one of our first episodes, I talked about how creative Emily Dickinson was at oh, masking. Yeah. She, you know, hard to survive never mind thrive at that time as a gay autistic woman but she found creative ways to do that and i think andy warhol did some pretty creative masking as well so um first of all he was surrounded by a lot of neurotypical people who would do things like talk for him like edie who got him and emotional supportalistic i like that yeah, right? I yeah, people have that like way like a sober friend. Yeah. Maybe we need a, like a neurotypical friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But well, someone to uh, help us filter the world. Yeah, exactly. And then this whole strange speech when it made him more money, he went with it. Like of he course. definitely got what it was doing. But in a weird way, he wasn't 
masking. Like he didn't force himself to become a really good speaker, but he found a way to use speaking the natural way that came to him as like a, almost a weapon in his branding arsenal. A trademark of eccentricity. Yeah. So like, how can we do this? Like, how can you think about this lesson of like, maybe there are places where you're masking. There's sometimes you mask to get healthcare. There are sometimes you mask to get um, not shot. Uh, Like, so there, there are reasons to have some masking skills in your arsenal. I think if you're consciously choosing them, but are there places where you're people pleasing or performing for neurotypicals that you could just build it into your brand? And I think that did take a lot of pressure off and created the space for him to make art because it takes up a lot of space to pretend to be neurotypical all day. Yeah, yeah. So there's a new, not that new, but I think 2021, there's a six-part documentary series that was done by one of his, oh, I was going to say neurotypical support animals. Nope. Neurotypical support friends. Uh, This guy, Pat, who followed him around basically for 40 or 50 years, writing down everything he said. And actually... Uh, Richard Branson, who I've gotten to spend a couple weeks with, um, I was in a special mastermind of women that uh, got to work with him. And he has somebody like this too. There's a guy for 40 years who's followed him around, written everything down and turns it into his books. So this is handy if you have the means for it. So there's this documentary series by this guy named Pat who like followed him around, was his personal assistant, wrote everything down. And three of the six parts of the documentary focus on his romantic life. Now, most people think of Andy Warhol as asexual. And he really cultivated that. But in this documentary series, they kind of explore it further. So here's a quote from the Time Magazine review. Although often depicted as asexual, or at least celibate, an impression he helped to manufacture, Warhol was a gay man who had infatuations, romances, and even live-in boyfriends. While he wasn't exactly closeted, many interviewees note his public silence about his identity, along with his avoidance of activism, particularly during the AIDS crisis. Yeah, and Keith Haring was like one of his best friends. Wow. He just like dropped that fucking ball. He's like, I'm not touching this shit. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, if he's already masking for, you know, being different, uh, you know, that's that's a whole nother layer to mask on. So... Mm-hmm. it's it's safer to and be like camouflaged. eastern eastern european yeah. background like that's add the immigrant factor so he's autistic well i think he's autistic he's gay he's got an interesting skin color some people call him albino he's not albino but has an interesting skin color for sure that's all part of his brand he wears that crazy silver wig again part of his brand Like he's got so many things that make him different and he just decides to go with asexual or even celibate, which would make most straight neurotypicals more comfortable. This is where we get into our people pleasing. And, you know, frankly, who knows how much of this is like he didn't want to drive down the cost of his art. Andy Warhol paintings make a lot more than Keith Haring's, even though Keith Haring does perfectly fine. But um he kind of knew that would marginalize him. So he's this like gay icon, but it's sort of problematic because he's not really, but he is, but he isn't. And again, it's cultivating this mystery is his big thing. The image. The image. Yeah. And so, uh, he had these sort of creative ways to deal with it. So, Um, He would do these parties, and when he would invite people to a party, he would tell them to wear costumes. He would wear, and you you could be anyone, you could play anything. They're like cosplay events. And you had to just like not talk about your job. They weren't small talk parties. You would make up a character, and everybody would sort of interact. The only good parties. 
right? So uh, this is a quote from one of the party attendees who said, and this is what they did at the factory, which was this space that he curated in New York. Everybody was already leaving their public personas at the door when they would enter in. And they used to call me up, uh, Andy used to call me up after he'd gotten home at night and say, oh, it's so good to take my Andy suit off. Wow. Really interesting. Wow. Right? So much masking. So much masking, but also I think one of the things is like a consciousness about it. Yeah. Like the putting it on and taking it off and knowing when you're doing it. Yeah. I think that's really healthy. I mean, I think many autistics just mask all the time or many gay people just mask 24 yeah. seven and they don't know when they're doing it, when they're not. So, but it's that, that's, it's putting on the costume in order to, you know, fulfill this social obligation. Yep. Every day is Halloween. Thanks for listening to the autistic culture podcast. We'll be right back. When autistic people find a special interest, they go deep and have a lot of knowledge, even if they don't have that formal education background to go with it. If you want to capture your spin in a book, check out Angela's work at differencepress.com, differencepress.com, and find out more about becoming an author and establishing your credibility with a book. A couple more things uh, about Andy. I had to share this one um, because it's another one I have in common with him. So uh, interestingly, the most comments we get from this podcast, and please drop a comment if this is you, is from parents who are listening to understand autistic culture because they have a kid who they either suspect is autistic or was recently um, diagnosed. So a friend and a listener of the pod was telling me, uh, she was listening to the show and we had talked about this topic. She's like, it is driving me crazy. My son will only wear one shirt and I am so sick of washing it. And I was like, what are you doing? Get 10, get 20. And she was like, oh, no, I did that. I have no problem with that. But even the identical shirt, he only likes one of them. And I'm like, oh, yeah, because it was washed the right amount of time. Because you have to get the new one. And yeah, you have to wash the other ones 30 or 40 times in order to get that feel. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I was like, oh, good point. I'm like, run him through the wash a few more times. So Andy was like this about um, his underwear, and so am I. I'm very picky yeah. about my underwear. Yeah. yeah, the yeah the first few rotations on new underwear is always iffy, which is why you know so much of my underwear has holes in it because they're very very comfortable. Yep. So I, exactly that, that, and that's why I have them. So um, Ian Stewart, who's that guy um, from the Rolling Stones, who starts obsessing about who's autistic and who isn't, he finds in Andy's autobiography, the one that Andy wrote, he finds this story, and this is the thing that seals it for him. Ian says he was initially struck by hearing of the artist's obsessive buying of the same make of green cotton underpants. He describes the process so carefully in his autobiography, A to B and Back Again, uh, A-B-B-A, uh, ABBA, neat. Say? <laughs> yeah, oh, I like that. That I was immediately reminded of autistic behavior. He was convinced the green ones felt different to the other colors. They did too, also with the Welch's snacks. The yeah, purple yeah. ones are totally different than the red ones. Like they're yeah. harder. They are a different texture. They, they I'm are. very color specific on the Welch's. Yeah. I'm sure the green ones felt different. Yeah. Yeah. Using a different dye, something changed it. Yeah. Obviously. Very hypersensitive to environmental stimuli because this is the way. So there is not a lot in the the autobiography. Ian calls it A to B and back in. It's actually from A to B and back again. Uh -huh. And it's very hard to find. You can find it. I actually didn't read it, but I read many pages that I could get screenshots of because it's like a couple hundred dollars. In one place, it was oh, wow. $1,500. I was uh, like, this is not in print because it was like weird. Nobody actually liked it. But there was a lot about the green underpants. He purchased them over and over again. It had to be from the same store. Had to be green. I totally get it. Uh, and that they, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that this is the way. That That's the only way that we can do things. 
Right. I love that so much. And like this also brings up when you have something good, like there was something, oh, my husband was just saying this. He just found something he loved. Can't remember what it was, a food thing or a clothes thing. And he's like, oh, I love this thing. And I'm like, go buy a lot right now. Go buy a lot immediately. They could cancel it at any moment. That's the thing. That's You never know when it's not going to be available anymore. Right. It's so, very so you scary. have to stock up when you can. Uh-huh. And that's that's I was like, my, don't worry about money. Get it now. My, there there are, and I have no doubt that there will be a massive run on this after I mention it. There are on Amazon cookies that come in an assortment of a unicorn, a rainbow, a unicorn face, and a unicorn star with a rainbow. These cook and they are very good vanilla cookies. They're very bright, mm. they're very vibrant. My son loves unicorn face cookies. And they only come in an assortment, and sometimes they go out of stock, but he cannot be without his unicorn face cookies. So the Easter dragon had to get lots and lots and lots of unicorn face cookies. So we now have a bucket of unicorn face cookies and a whole bunch of the other cookies that came with it that will, you know, will gradually. Those are for guests. Yeah, Yeah. for guests. (laughs) But he needs his unicorn face cookies because we can't possibly be without them. Right. I do the same thing with things that come in an assortment. I have to separate because yeah. I don't like all, but some of them I will eventually get to. Yeah. But I yeah. I can't. It's stuff that you might pass out at Halloween or something because, you know, just yeah. get rid of it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, but this leads to the last thing I want to share with you about Andy Warhol, whose estate says he for sure is an autistic, is ah! that he had a massive hoarding problem. So not just the green underwear, but after he died, there were hundreds of packets of unopened green underwear and also oh. something his estate called, wait for it, it's going to feel like a knife through the heart, pointless trinkets oh that uh, i thought you were hyperbolizing there but oh my god it really does i hope you're feel okay like, yeah oh pointless oh trinkets. it hurts uh oh oh god that hurts so much i'm sure that's what he did he's like oh look here's a pointless trinket let me say i'm sure they were all just point he's like these are pointless yeah it's the dingle hopper i need a dingle hopper I I am playing with an eight ball. I don't own a billiards it's table. A pointless I just trinket. wanted a yeah. It's a it, pointless trinket. I, yeah, there are so many things that I love, but again, the neurotypicals in the world would say, "Why do you have that pointless trinket?" Yes. Well, let me give you the example of that they were most horrified by a collection he had. A collection. This is the pointless trinkets. A collection of cookie jars. Cookie jars are highly collectible. They're unique. They're whimsical. Why? Who would not want a collection of cookie why jars? Why is that pointless? What the hell? I don't understand why that's pointless. Who's discriminating against Andy Warhol's autistic tendencies? I don't. That's, yes. Well. Oh, my God. They're wonderful. Everyone needs cook, multiple cookie jars. I, 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 I ha- agree. I happen <laughs> to have both a cookie monster and a hippo because the hippo was whimsical and delightful. Yeah, so uh, Claudia Kalb wrote, Andy Warhol was a hoarder. We're going to give her the last quote here. So here is Claudia. This is a quote for you. Oh, wow. Warhol refused to throw anything away. He incorporated his hoarding into his art. He collected around 600 time capsule cardboard boxes where he stored everything from old receipts to pizza dough. These boxes have been displayed as art. While he collected lots of junk, it was clear from his journals that his reluctance to throw anything away caused him great anxiety and stress. He once wrote, I'd love to have a really clean space. Uh, I. This is so funny because pointless trinkets, he refused to throw anything away. And then she's like, because he used it for art and sold it and made a lot of money from it. So yeah. like... So he has 600 boxes that are called time capsules that he is using in his artwork. Yeah. 
I'm sure there's no, like, I know you can't get to making all that art, but do you know what it feels like when you have an idea? You're like, I'm going to do a piece. It's going to be receipts through the ages. So let me save all my receipts. Cause when I do that piece, I want to look through all the possible receipts. Cause I'm only going to pick 10 of them for this art piece. And then you're going to start doing it. And if you threw something out and you didn't collect all of them, what will be the one you want for that piece of art? Yeah. The one you threw out that you can't find. So yes, it causes me anxiety because if I ever want it and I threw it out, then I only have myself to blame. Let us know in the comments if you have boxes of hobbies or other things that you got because you might need them at some point, but you're not currently using them. Uh, right. AKA yeah. everyone. So just drop yeah. a fucking emoji. So that to me is just shows this like complete lack of understanding. And then I wonder when he says, I'd love to have a really clean space, which I'm sure he'd love to have a clean space. Like I get that. That's also a thing for sure. Me too. But, I just like, need a house that's five times bigger. Right. Well, I think Andy Warhol could have bought it. That's the thing. Yeah. So that's why I wonder how, how much of it, some percentage, but how much of it is you really want a clean space and how much of it is I don't want the guilt and shame and anxiety of collecting things, got to catch them all, yeah. which feels good to autistic, hyper-connected brains when you can see all the ways you could use this stuff. Now, like I'm not advocating for like dirty apartments and rodents and things like that by any means, but I am saying there is a logic to collecting that it sure sounds like he had. Yes. There's the logic on display behind Matt and behind me. Literally, have I told you this? I'm probably going to say it in every episode. People keep asking me which books I'm taking when we move to England. It's like, which children will you be killing? What a monstrous question that is. It it's horrifies It's monstrous. Me. It's oh my monstrous. God. Yeah. So... And so I would love a really clean space, but really what I would love is to not have the anxiety around the gre the shame yeah. about being a collector. That's, that's why we need space to show off our wonderful collections and to have validation from other people to say, my, that is a fine collection you have. Right. Right. So he yeah. knew what he was doing. 600 time capsule cardboard boxes. Like that does not show me these were pointless trinkets. And he was just dumping them in a box. He had a plan to use them and dude died kind of yeah. young. So that uh. is my, I don't know, Andy Warhol is definitely uh, a, an example of autistic culture. He is a collector. He is a lover of fine underwear and other soft clothing. He is a connoisseur of the details. He is somebody who used his unique communication style uh, to make a whole lot of money, which is very creative. Um, he was able to use masking to build a personal brand. And really, he was able to use his sensitive stomach and some of his stomach concerns to center same food at the center of his brand. And he made a living and great money doing his special interest. So... Hats is, off, Andy Warhol. Life well lived. That is autistic success, success, and you can't argue with it. That's fantastic. When people go to therapy with you, I know you've talked about how you help them live an uh, autistic life better. And I think this is a good example of some of the things they can walk away with. Obviously, this was the 60s and 70s and early 80s. So, um you know, he, he wasn't doing it intentionally, but imagine if he got to work with you or somebody like you and actually just did it intentionally, how different would your life be? Yeah. And, and that actually ties into my favorite thing about being autistic this week, that, uh, uh, we, we have a lot of free groups for people because community is what is most important. Because we don't need to change being autistic. We don't need to cure being autistic. We need to be understood. We need to be loved. We need to be accepted. And we, we, there's one group in particular where uh, across a few hours, I talked to a few different people within that group. 
And everyone was talking about how great the group is and how much they love talking to each other. And I was like, oh, that's so neat. Because they're one person said, no, I'm actually very happy today. And I was like, well, that's fantastic. I'm so glad that you're happy because, you know, you, you, you don't need to come to therapy when you're happy. Uh, the whole point of therapy is to work yourself mm. out of a job. But mm. everybody likes getting together and doing things and making plans. And they're all planning on doing things together because they found each other and they enjoy doing things with each other and talk with each other and just being themselves with each other. And yeah. they found their people. And uh, it's just, it's, it's great. And I'm, I'm very, very happy that they do their things that they found each other and that, you know, uh, basically the only thing I did was, Hey, why don't y'all talk? But yeah. they all talked and it makes me very, very happy that that exists now. And I, I really dig that there is a community out there because uh, if uh, they're all younger people, I wish that I had such a community when I was younger uh, yeah. I think that more people out there need to find themselves earlier because otherwise you get to be uh, a middle-aged person and say, yeah, I do this and I do this and I do this and I'm weird and nobody likes me and I can't do this, but I'm definitely not autistic. I don't know what I am. I'm just alone. Right. And being just alone, alone or just don't like people, you will find your people. I where I think you have the best chance of finding your people is in your special interest oh, yeah. and in spaces designed for autistic people yeah that's you, like and it's gonna be a game changer when you find your people yeah it's it, it the clouds lift it's it's the wizard of oz going from uh you know black and white to technicolor all mm. of a sudden the world makes sense and you have a place in it and i i want more people to find their people because this this is what you need uh it's 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 a lifelong, we, there are three big questions in life. Who am I? Where did I come from? And where am I going? Once mm -hmm. you find where you came from, it helps you find who you are. And that leads to where you're going. And it solves a lot of existential stress. Yeah. And I think that I'm just a loner. I'm just weird. I'm just different. It can be self-protective, but yeah really discovering how much connection means to you and how much that I'm a loner or I don't need people is just self-protective. Like giving yourself that opportunity at any age. I mean, awesome if you can do this when you're young, but I don't care how old you are. Like today is a great day to give it a shot um, to find out because connection is really what it's all about. Connection yeah. and creativity. That's all we got really. Yeah. So. All right. Well, it's been another episode of the Autistic Culture Podcast. Please like, share, and review, and please tell a friend. It really helps. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Autistic Culture Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, no one ever changed the world by being like everyone else. You can find out more about writing your book with me at differencepress.com. That's Difference, D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-C-E, -F -E -E, press, dot -E com, Or getting a psychological evaluation or consult with me at www.mattlowrylpp.com. That's M-A-T-T, -T, Matt Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y, L-P-P, -P, as in Licensed Psychological Practitioner, dot com.